Welcome to our second lecture covering the topic of terminating individual employees. Um, so during our first presentation, we talked about the issue of constructive discharge versus the situation in which the employee chooses on his or her own to resign. And of course, we contrasted that also with the situation in which the employer ends the employment relationship. <clears throat> then we discuss the usual rule for um, private sector employees who work in a non-unionized setting, that being employment at will, and we talked about a few exceptions. Then we talked about um, a, a greater view of the exceptions. The, the exceptions up here that we were looking at was um, the Sabine pilot standard and also retaliation and wh whistleblower type protections. And then the impermissible grounds of termination, we talked about all the things pretty much we spent the semester talking about, uh, this, uh, the Title VII, ADA, ADEA, FLSA, all of the uh, alphabet soup of different statutes that protect employees from discrimination and provide them with a safe <clears throat> a working environment in which they are fairly compensated. In this presentation, we're going to discuss kind of the exception, uh, the non-at-will employment scenario. Uh, that would be the, the just cause or the due process situation. <clears throat> and this, again, is, doesn't apply to the majority of workers, but it applies usually to governmental employees as well as union, unionized employees. And then finally, we'll talk about how to handle terminations when you do decide that that's the right course of action what should be uh, the approach in terms of procedure to handle those situations. So <clears throat> let's go to our starting point for today. And again, we're on that just cause slash due process. So when you are uh, working in a unionized facility supporting the, the management of those circumstances, your, your document as an HR professional will be the uh, CBA, the Collective Bargaining Agreement. That will explain the rights and responsibilities that the employer has with respect to the employees and the rights and responsibilities that the employees have and the union has with respect to the employer. <clears throat> it will also usually in great detail explain um, the, the grievance process and how that plays out in the workplace. Um, and so you will be spending a lot of time kind of maneuvering in that environment and deciding how to, to handle uh, 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 disciplinary issues that come up in that situation. And the grievance process is usually very proceduralized. Um, the union is involved, the union steward acts as the advocate for the employee in the process. Um, there's usually a few steps, um, the, a meeting to discuss potential uh, resolution of the issues, which can escalate eventually into an arbitration type proceeding. <clears throat> um, and in most union situations, that process goes forward even when it's pretty clear that the employee doesn't have a very good claim. The union doesn't always have to pursue the, these um, uh, claims if he, it finds that they are baseless. But um, at least in my experience, the union typically does decide to go ahead and uh, continue that process if the employee wants to go through the process. In most cases, the employee does. So um, that can involve a significant amount of resources that both the union and the employer have to invest in that process. Um, and. Uh, Again, that's just kind of the, the nature of the um, entity. So if it does go into arbitration, the types of questions that the uh, arbitrator is going to focus on, first of all, is, you know, what does the contract say? <clears throat> and then uh, more procedurally, uh, the, the arbitrator is going to look at, well, what was the rule? If there wasn't a written rule, what was the standard and how was that followed? A uh, question relating to that is, was the standard reasonable? Was it consistently followed? So again, they're going to be looking for situations that the, uh, there's a variation for the procedure. Was the employee offered due process? Was he given an opportunity or she given an opportunity to explain what, what happened or why he or she did um, what was involved? Is there sufficient proof? Now, of course, we're working in a, <clears throat> a um, 
a civil type of situation. Loss of employment is obviously not a crime situation. Um, and so a court of law would look at this from a, a preponderance of the evidence standard, standard. In other words, is it more likely or not that it happened this way or more likely than not that it happened that way? In my experience, arbitrators are usually putting a, a heavier burden on the employer. Probably not a beyond the reasonable doubt standard, but probably more than a preponderance of the evidence. Um, typically in uh, litigation that we have over you know, Title VII and things like that, while it's a good idea to give the employee due process, to allow the employee to uh, defend himself or herself before a final decision is made, to be able to present evidence, <clears throat> the failure to, to, the decision to not provide the employee that opportunity rarely dooms the, the case in a civil situation. It's a bad fact, but it's not a deal breaker. In front of the arbitrator, though, that is likely to be a fact that is difficult to overcome. Um, progressive discipline is definitely something arbitrators are looking to see. Now, not every uh, violation is appropriate for progressive discipline. For example, a theft situation, especially theft of something of significant value, obviously progressive discipline doesn't make sense in that situation. Uh, significant cases of assault or sexual or otherwise um, <clears throat> would also be situations where progressive discipline may not be appropriate. Is the discipline consistent with the offense? Again, the standard here is, is or, or the, the uh, likely perspective that the arbitrator is going to have is that the, you know, this is the death penalty. Um, this person may never be able to economically recover from this loss. And so uh, the, the offense has to be very, very uh, grave for that to be considered a reasonable um, consequence. Um, arbitrators fairly commonly do something that I'm going to refer to as split the baby. Um, <clears throat> so th they're confronting a situation in which an employee has been dismissed. Um, the, uh, the employer, excuse me, the arbitrator can obviously uphold the dismissal or can reinstate the worker. A fairly common middle ground that the that the arbitrator may take is to um, reinstate the employee, but to have some kind of consequence for the employee. For example, let's say that it's taken four months for this case to go in front of the arbitrator. The arbitrator might say, well, we'll just treat these last four months as a suspension, or we'll treat the first two months of a suspension and the employee is entitled to back pay for the other two months or something along those lines. So it's designed to give a little bit of a win to the employer and a little bit of win to the employee. Uh, that kind of split the baby aspect is fairly common with arbitrators and that has to do with the culture of arbitration. Let me spend a little bit of time explaining this to you because it's not something that it necessarily is, is immediate, uh, immediately obvious. The way arbitrators are usually selected is um, there will be a panel appointed by the AAA or whatever the agency is it's doing it. And we'll just think about the panel having five members. And this isn't just true for labor arbitration, it's true really for any arbitration. <clears throat> and so the panel starts, we'll say with five, but it, at the end is just gonna be one person left so four are going to be eliminated so one of the parties gets to eliminate first and this is going to turn on the terms of the contract but let's just assume that the employer gets to eliminate one first well the employer and the empl and the union have access to all or most of the published opinions that these arbitrators have have made and also to a biography about the employer employer uh, the arbitrators what type of, of law they had practiced previously, what firms they were associated with. So it's pretty easy to see whether they tended to side with the employer or the employee. So obviously the first um, arbitrator that the employer is gonna strike off is the one that it identifies as the one to be most likely pro-employee. And let's say it's Bob here. Then the, um, um, employee or the union gets an opportunity to strike and of course it has access to the same data so it's going to want to strike the employee the arbitrator who is most likely to be pro-employer we'll say that's D now it's back to the employer well he's B was his first choice but now he's going to strike 
who or strike whomever is of the remaining a c e most likely to be pro employee and let's say in its decision it thinks it's a and now the uh, employee and the union get to strike between c and e it's obviously going to try to choose the one that it thinks is most likely to rule in favor of the employer and we'll say that that is c so the panel ends up with e so E is going to be the most middle of the road. You know, if you were to rank them from most pro-employee to most pro-employer, the one who's actually going to get appointed is in this, this middle. <clears throat> All these panel members know how this works. So the panel members, when they publish or when they write their arbitration decisions, are ideally seeking to be in this sweet spot. They want their decisions to be such that both employers and employees look at it and go, well, gosh, they didn't really favor one side over the other. So I'm not going to use my strike to get rid of this person. So the arbitrators being aware of this tendency are likely to get involved in kind of these split the baby type scenarios where they're not really uh, taking a position. Oh, yes, the employee was completely right or Yes, the employer was completely right. Uh, uh, arbitrators who take that position don't get too many arbitrations assigned to them. Um, as I said before, progressive discipline is a big deal in union situations, but it's also a big deal in non-union situations. Just a little refresher on what progressive discipline is. Progressive discipline is when as an employee continues to have offenses, the consequences for those offenses go up. So your first step might be a verbal warning. So let's say I was tardy to my workstation one day. My supervisor might come by and say, hey Gruber, everything okay? Oh yeah, everything's fine. <clears throat> um, I saw that you were a little late getting to your station today. Yeah, a, a bad uh, traffic jam on the way to work. Well, okay, that happens. Just try to you know, maybe get here a little bit early. It's important that everybody be in the workstation when the day starts. Um, okay, sure boss, I get it. And so that would be the first one. Then maybe the second one, we'll say this is the first verbal. Uh, the, the, my supervisor may or may not formally note it in his, in his log or whatever, but, but the second one comes up. Uh, this time he calls me to his office. It's not some casual thing in the hall. He says, you know, he, he may be on the loudspeaker, says, you know, Groover, come to, you know, the, my office or whatever. And so I go over to office and he goes, hey, you know, Groover, I, I see that you were about five minutes late. Everything okay? Oh, uh, yeah, just another bad traffic jam. Well, you know, Groover, it, that happens. We all know that it happens. Uh, but it's happened, you know, this is the second time this month, and, and that's becoming a problem. And so I really need you to get here earlier than what you're doing so that if there is a traffic jam, you're going to be okay. Can I count on you to do that? Sure, boss. Um, I'm going to have to document this in my folder. I just want to let you know. I don't want it to go any farther. I'm sure it won't, but just to let you know that this is the second late, and so um, I'm going to have to fill out paperwork. Oh, okay. Well, I'll try to do better. Then the next one might be the first written. And this time when I come in, there's something presented in front of me that I'm asked to sign. Maybe I sign it, maybe I don't. That's my decision. And the fact that I sign it doesn't mean that I agree with it, but simply that it was covered with me. And um, very likely this formal document explains what the next steps will be. Maybe there's another written. Maybe this is the second written. Then I go to that one. And then after this one, maybe I get suspended for a week. Maybe that will be the next consequence. And then if I have a, a, another occurrence, then I am dismissed. That's an example of progressive discipline. You can see each time it's gotten a little bit more serious. Very likely each one of these uh, documents as we go further in the process talks about the other steps. The reason why we're moving to the second written is that Groover's already had her first and second verbal and her first written. And it very likely will include the dates that I had those conversations. And it will talk about the various lates that I 
you know, whatever my issues in this case it was lights, but whatever the issue is, how that um, uh, proceeds. Um, an employer who has progressive discipline uh, for that particular offense ideally ought to use it consistently. Um, if there are uh, deviations from that process, then that, that ought to, uh, the employer ought to be able to defend it. For example, let's say that um, my boss was um, in the hospital at the time for this second verbal and there were just uh, too much work to be done and not the, the supervisor not being there, no, uh, no one sat down with me and talked to me about my second uh, late. And so therefore, when I had my third late, it should have been the first written, but they decide, well, since I hadn't gotten the opportunity of the second verbal, then that would be covered with me. So um, I actually got an extra late than what the system ordinarily would permit. Um, but that would likely have been explained when they actually do cover the second verbal. Although Groover had a late on this day because her supervisor was on an extended leave of absence, we weren't able to meet with Groover to discuss it at that time, therefore we are now covering that topic on this subsequent late or something along those lines to uh, document, yes, we missed that one and to explain why we missed that one. If you are in a situation where you jump ahead, where you either skip a step in, entirely or um, uh, uh, don't follow all the, the steps involved in that particular uh, uh, path, um, you ought to again be, a, be presenting a reason. For example, uh, maybe you have one policy for tardies that are under five minutes and another policy for tardies that are between five and 20 minutes and a third policy for tardies that are over 20 minutes. Um, and so you might treat those differently. Again, these would be things that you'd want to, you know, have consistency throughout the process. Um, and have uh, employees generally be well, be aware of what these distinctions are. Um, so this progressive discipline makes sense in a union sit sit scenario. Certainly that's questions that the arbitrator is going to ask. And, um, so that's useful in that context, but it's also useful in the non-union situation. It's useful in the non-union situation in a couple of different ways. First of all, it can be a good union avoidance tool. Uh, the workers will know, well, gosh, we don't even have to pay for, um, you know, having the grievances. Our, our employer is, is already giving us the benefit of that. So we can save our, our due money that we would have spent on dues, spend it on ourselves and reap the benefits of what we would have gotten from a union anyway. So it's a good union avoidance tool in many situations. Number one, number two, it is an effective way to defend oneself against discrimination claims because after all, most discrimination claims have resulted in a dismissal. And so if you have this well-established process that you followed consistently, well, it's going to be very difficult for the employer for the employee to show that there was any type of discrimination. It's going to be very easy for you to you, the employer, to prove that um, there was a non-discriminatory reason for the disciplinary action taken. Okay, let's talk about public sector employees. So generally speaking, public and sector employees are going to uh, many times have the benefit of civil service laws, and they're also going to be able to assert various constitutional protections. Even though their employer is the, the government, and so their relationship isn't quite the same as citizen to government, in many respects, they're, the rights that they would have against the government telling them where to go to church or, um, or you know uh, what what uh, what they should say or what they should think. Um, there is some level to which the government can't tell its employees those same things because even though um, so because obviously these these employees are still citizens and still entitled to protection from the federal government. So um, again, that this part or these parts don't have to do with unionization. This has to do with when you work for the government and it can be the federal government, it can be the state government, it can be the local government. These rules, by the way, usually don't apply or they apply at least in a different form if you're talking about military service. So most uh, governmental bodies have civil service laws and these are designed to protect and insulate employees from politics. Uh, so for imagine, for example, that you are a paralegal working in the district attorney's office. Well, the district attorney is a political uh, person. 
I don't mean that in a good light or a bad light. He or she is elected by the citizens. And so he or she in Texas at least will be identified with, with a particular political party. It may or may not be his or her true political views, but it's the, the party that um, you know was successful in that particular election. Um, but most of the people that work in the district attorney's office aren't involved in the political side of things. I mean, they may have political views, they may even have strong political views, but they're here to do the job of prosecuting uh, people who have been charged with crimes, which is, you know, neither a Republican or Democrat issue, it's just a matter of, you know, enforcing the laws. And so if we had a system in which, let's say, party X gets voted out, so party Y's candidate is now the DA, well, if that DA could come in and say, well, I'm going to fire all, let, let's say that the district attorney is a, we'll say he's a Democrat, although it works equally well if we're a Republican, but in our example, we'll say he's a Democrat. And so he says, well, um, all, I'm going to fire all the Republicans in this department, or I'm going to fire all the people who supported the other person who was the district attorney. I'm going to fire the other attorneys. I'm going to fire the paralegals. I'm going to fire the secretaries and clerk, file clerks. And then I'm going to replace them with all of my cronies, the people who happen to have campaigned for me, contributed to my campaign, who are on my side. I may even fire some people who were on the fence, who really didn't take a position one way or the other, so that I can put my cronies into position. And then, of course, once that Democrat gets voted out by, say, the Republican, the Republican turns around and does the same thing. Well, as you can see, as a result of this kind of flip-flop, uh, people who are not interested in political activity, who just want a steady paycheck, aren't going to want to work for the district attorney's office. They are going to want to stay clear of that because they don't want to get, lose their job just because there's a different uh, uh, party in control in this particular county. And so generally, um, civil servants, people who aren't at the very top of the hierarchy, uh, will be allowed to retain their position even when uh, one party loses favor and then another party uh, gains favor. Most of the staff isn't serving at the pleasure of the district attorney, for example. We also have tenure laws, and these have to do with um, uh, uh, public school teachers and also university teachers. And in the context of the universities, it applies both in the public area and the private area. We have the idea of tenure. Um, and tenure can be developed in lots of different ways. Typically in Texas, in our public schools, uh, teachers will get uh, tenure after three years of employment in that particular school district. So if, a, for example, a principal identifies that a particular teacher isn't being effective in the first or second or even third year, the principal can say, well, we're not going to renew your contract. But if he decides or she decides in the fourth year that the uh, teacher isn't being effective or is causing some problem, then there's going to be a much more arduous process to discontinue the employment relationship. And so as a result, um, it's relatively rare for teachers to uh, lose their positions except very, very early on. Even then, it's not common. And a similar uh, process works for it at the university level. Now let's talk about the constitutional rights that uh, uh, apply to public employees. So public employees are going to have uh, due process rights related to their property. They have a property interest in their job. And I know that sounds kind of crazy. Your job isn't property. And they also, there's also a liberty interest that they have. And then, of course, they have the right to freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and freedom of association. And these extend even to their employment relationship. So if I am fired from my job, I am essentially losing my property if I am a governmental employee. And so um, I have just like if, if the government were to take my land, that the takings clause requires that I'm entitled to due process in that situation. Well, if the government takes away my job, that's a, since I have a property interest in my job, I have that same right to due process under those situations. So here's some, uh, but, but the right to uh, protection under the Constitution is not limitless in this situation. For example, let's say I happen to be a member of, I'm, I'm a Methodist, and 
Um, I really don't, uh, I, I am constantly interested in proselytizing. That's all I really want to do all day. I feel like it's my mission to talk to everybody whom I see about how awesome my religion is. So, um, I, uh, my job is to be a, uh, let, let's say I, I function as a, uh, uh, CPS caseworker. So I uh, deal with children who are at risk um, within their family, perhaps uh, from some type of abuse or neglect. And so I do home visits. I evaluate how the parents are interacting with the children, make sure that the, the housing is appropriate, that the children are properly fed and cared for. Um, I also place children in foster uh, situations so, and I confirm that their treatment is appropriate there. So imagine I go visit a house and, and this family isn't Methodist, we'll say that they're uh, Buddhist. And so I come to see them and I see that they have some indicia of their religious faith. And I begin by saying, well, I want to tell you all about Methodism. And I'd like to spend the first hour of our visit talking about how awesome Jesus is and how you really ought to be a Christian. And that's really what you need to do. And that's how you need to raise your children. And I do this, you know, whenever I visit anyone and some of the people I visit are of the Christian faith, some aren't, uh, some are Methodist, some aren't, but in each case, I, I uh, try to pressure the families to either join my religion or become more devout or whatever. Well, the government doesn't have to permit that. Yes, I absolutely have the right to my fr uh, religious freedoms to expre express my views, but I don't have the right to do that while I'm on the clock. So the employer, in this case, the government would be completely, it would be completely appropriate of the government to discipline me for that. In fact, I would say that because I am essentially uh, the government from the perspective of these families, that there would be an establishment problem under the Constitution if the government didn't uh, uh, sanction me under those circumstances. Because after all that, um, Buddhist family might feel like, oh, well, the only way we'll be able to uh, maintain custody of our children is if we convert to Methodism. Well, in other words, I was representing the, the state for them, and they felt that in order to keep the state happy with them, they needed to join a, a religion. Well, that would be a violation of the Establishment Clause. So uh, the government would be appropriate to discipline me in those cir circumstances. But let me give you another example. Let's say during my lunch hour at work, I have given an hour for lunch, and that's from noon until one. During that hour, uh, there's a cafeteria, and I um, meet with three other uh, employees. We sit down together, we say a prayer, and while we're eating lunch, we engage in a Bible study. Uh, we aren't disrupting any activities in the cafeteria. Um, and we're not really interfering, but there are other people in the workplace who are uncomfortable seeing that people are praying and, and opening the Bible and things like that. It just makes them kind of feel a little bit uneasy. They're not quite sure what that is. They're not quite sure that they want to be around that. And so there's been some complaints about, well, you know, should people really be allowed to do that at work? Why don't they do that when they're home or something along those, those lines? Well, this would be a situation which the employer would not be able to discriminate against the employee based upon his or her expression of their religious beliefs. Um, and so that would be an example of protected religious activity. Let's consider um, how a claim for retaliation for exercising First Amendment speech rights might play out. Well, of course, the first thing is the employee needs to have engaged in uh, constitutionally protected speech. So it has to be speech about a public concern. The speech was engaged in as a citizen rather than an employee and would balance against the legitimate interests of the government agency in effective and efficient operations. The speech was not unduly detrimental or disruptive. Okay, so let's imagine that um, I'm, again, I'm a CPS worker, uh, a, ch a child protective services worker, and um, I am, uh, I, because of my involvement with um, uh, the uh, child protective uh, function, I um, have some insightful ideas about 
um, how schools can best serve the needs of foster children because obviously foster children often move from school to school and so there can be some discontinuities you know in one school maybe they they cover this particular math skill early in the year and another school they cover it later in the year well if a child moves between schools maybe he or she misses education on that particular concept anyway so I have some ideas about what would be better for a children maybe maybe my idea is we ought to standardize when during the course of the year a particular topic in math is covered or whatever the top the issue is well, certainly that subject would be, and so let's say I'm going to speak in front of the Texas legislature. I'm going to uh, be a witness. Well, that would be a matter of public concern. And I am a citizen and I am speaking just on my own behalf and I make it clear when I'm making the presentation that while my expertise is a result of my involvement with the government, I am speaking not as a representative of the government, but as a, a citizen expressing my views. And then let's say under these circumstances that um, um, the, the legitimate interest of the government agency in efficient and effective operations was not um, unduly uh, inconvenienced under those circumstances. Well, if that is the case, then the government agency can't discipline me for expressing that speech. Even if the governmental agency uh, would actually prefer a different solution than the one I'm suggesting. Maybe it feels, well, um, we, don't, we feel like each ISD ought to be able to decide how it's going to organize its curriculum over the course of the year. They have to cover all these topics, but whether they cover topic X in the first uh, six weeks or the last six weeks, that's for them to figure out. And so that may be the position that the state of Texas government entity is, is taking, which is different than my position. Um, so that would be an example that I would be able to speak under those circumstances. But let me give you another scenario. Let's say, again, I'm a CPS worker and I am testifying as to um, particular procedures that the CPS uses in its care of foster children. And I am pointing out that these procedures are detrimental to children. Uh, well, in this situation, it is a matter of public concern. Obviously, we're all concerned about the welfare of foster children. Um, um, and I may be called to do this as a citizen instead of being called to testify as an employee. But you can see how me testifying about the ins and outs of the procedures of the CPS, especially in a critical way, might be detrimental and disruptive for the operations of my employer. And so in that situation, the agency probably be within its bounds to discipline me um, for uh, talking kind of out of turn under those circumstances. Let's imagine a different scenario. I'm a CPS worker this time, just as I was before. But this time, I'm not speaking as Cynthia Groover. I'm speaking as a member of the staff of CPS. And so I am speaking in my official capacity. I'm on the, I'm, in other words, I'm um, working when I speak, when I testify. And I know that what the agency wants to have happen is X, Y, Z. And so let's say once I get on the stand and I'm sworn in, instead of delivering the testimony that I have told my employer I'm going to deliver, that I'm expected to deliver, that is consistent with the CPS's mission, I deliver testimony that's different. Well, in this situation, um, while the matter was of public concern, it was part of my um, duties as an employee. And so therefore, um, this element is missing, and so I'm not going to be able to uh, uh, successfully sue for retaliation under those circumstances. So the bottom line is, it's not a protection for any speech that I give, um, but it is, it is a greater level of speech protection than you would have in the private sector. The bottom line is, in the private sector, um, there really are no protections from freedom of speech. Now, we do have some protections in the area of religion because, of course, um, there are protections against religious discrimination, and there's even the requirement that the employee reasonably accommodate, employer reasonably accommodate the, the uh, a religious observance of the employee. Uh, but, but freedom of speech, freedom of association, those aren't ideas that apply in the private sector. Let's talk about handling the dismissal. Um, no one likes to fire people. Well, very few people like to fire people. It is an uncomfortable, unpleasant task. Um, I've 
have haven't told people in the past so what one of the the very best things probably the only good thing about being in hr or working in the hr function is that when you go to a job interview and they say and they ask you the question what did you like least about your last job you can always say i didn't like to fire people and everyone is going to think well yeah a good answer <laughs> of course you didn't want to fire people that makes you a human being um, it's it's an unfortunate aspect of working in HR you will at from time to time have to fire people um, knowing how to do it having the procedures kind of worked out in your head can make it easier for you and can make it easier for the employee who is whose employment is, is ending it's um, uh, not a, a pleasant task under the best of circumstances and usually it's not the best of circumstances. Um, I'm going to start by sharing with you a couple of stories. Uh, I have only faced, a, I've only fired people directly um, a few times in my life. Certainly less, we'll say, about 10 or 10 or fewer. So it's not, it was not a regular part of my professional life. Uh, many people who work in the HR function have fired hundreds or more people, uh, especially in, in um, uh, high turnover type uh, areas. That's not an uncommon thing. So I'm not here to say that I have extensive experience in dismissing people, but while I, I was not usually the person dismissing, I did approve the dismissal of uh, thousands of people, I think it's fair to say. Um, the, the, there were rules in place when I was at JCPenney that certain categories of terminations, they had to run it by me before I could bless it. And there were two individuals uh, whom I uh, approved the termination for who attempted suicide. Uh, one was successful. Uh, he was fired um, in the unit where he was working. He went out to the parking lot. He had a gun in his car and he killed himself in the, in the parking lot. Uh, the other situation, the um, man attempted suicide but was not successful. He survived. Um, he, his wife was also employed in the facility and um, uh, obviously he didn't return to pains but we, we continue to um, know and be aware of, of the wife who remained an employee in good standing. Um, those are experiences, and again, I, I was removed, fortunately, from those experiences. I was not the person who went into the parking lot. I was not the person who uh, had those final conversations with those two individuals. Um, but I, I will tell you honestly that those stories stay with you. Um, I have thought many times about those two individuals. Um, in both cases, the individuals were people that it was very, very clear needed to not be employed at this particular place anymore. There was no ambiguity. There was no a real per, uh, possible way of looking at this uh, other than this was the right decision to make. Um, in the case of the individual who uh, was successful at killing himself, uh, people from the unit, uh, management of the unit, did attend his funeral, and his parents uh, came and talked to the manager and said, you shouldn't feel guilty about this. Our, our son had a lot of psychiatric issues and, um, you know, this was, this was not as unexpected. It was terribly sad and, and very awful, but uh, the, the, the loss of employment was not the only thing that was going on in this person's life. In the other situation, the person who attempted suicide, I think, um, wasn't so much killing himself because he was losing the job as um, the shame of the discovery of what he had done. So um, I, I, well, I guess what I'm trying to say is that you have to think through the impact that your decisions will have upon uh, the individual, upon his or her family, upon the workplace. Um, you won't know who might go out to the car and attempt to, to end his life. Um, in both of the cases where the individuals attempted suicide, um, no one was thinking that was what was going to happen. Um, and so you have to uh, think that through and kind of make your peace with the decision uh, before you kind of enter into it. I guess what I'm trying to say is that these are big decisions that have lasting implications on people's lives. Um, another case I can think about, 
this individual did not harm himself. He was dismissed um, for uh, repeatedly looking at pornography in his work workplace. Um, he was given uh, at least two warnings and then he was dismissed. He was a, an older person and um, uh, he did not tell his wife why he was dismissed. Um, he uh, uh, told his wife that he would, had been laid off from work. He, he and his wife attended the same church that the, minist that the uh, head uh, person for this facility also attended. And the wife was, was very upset that her, her husband had been laid off, especially since he had such long service. And so she thought to herself, well, surely they should have laid off the, the, the more recent hires, not this very long service employee. So he, she went up after the religious service was over and approached uh, the manager and, and started speaking to him uh, strongly, uh, sternly and saying, you know, I, I can't believe you did this. This is financially devastating for us. Um, and the manager just kind of had to stand there and say, you know, I'm so sorry that you're going through this difficult situation. But he wasn't able to say what, what I'm sure he wanted to say, which is, no, your, your husband wasn't laid off. Your, your husband was dismissed because of intentional con misconduct that he had that he knew that would, would ultimately result in this. So um, there are lots of layers. There's lots of things to consider when you're dealing with these types of issues. Um, and for that reason, dismissal should not be approached lightly, should not be approached as the first option. Um, it's a good idea to consider before you get to termination other things that you can do. Retraining, transferring to a different department, demoting to lesser responsibilities, perhaps doing some type of suspension. It can be a day, it can be a week, it can be a month. Um, signing a, a, la a last chance agreement. Hey, we're giving you one more chance, but if you break this, if you, you know, surf and, and visit those websites again, or if you're, um, uh, you know, uh, if you don't meet your productivity goals for this week or whatever, then that will be the, the end of the employment. Sometimes an issue will come up about whether you should allow an employee to resign his or her employment. I mean, in some sense, up until the time that you dismiss, you, you can't stop that person from resigning. I mean, it's an at-will situation. Um, and oftentimes, uh, you, it, it will be abundantly obvious to the employee that, yes, I'm going to be dismissed on that day because I have this appointment. And I know that my, on my performance improvement plan, that's the final date. And I know that I haven't met my goals. And so, you know, I know that that's coming down the pike. And sometimes an employee will uh, preempt and start the conversation by saying, I resign. I don't see any downside to doing that. Um, in my opinion, if the employee would prefer to tell the world, I resigned instead of being dismissed, um, I think that there's no reason not to assist him in saving his face and, and allowing him to make that representation. He may turn around and file for unemployment or he may turn around and allege discrimination or a constructive discharge type claim. Since you were going to fire him anyway, and he probably knew that fact, it doesn't really mean that he can't advance those types of claims just because he actually said the word, I quit, instead of you actually saying the words, you're fired. Um, so it, it doesn't necessarily protect the employer from um, a lawsuit, but it does create a good fact. Juries like to see somebody being treated with courtesy and respect through this very, very difficult process. Um, no one wants to, or let me put this way, um, even somebody who's done something very bad um, deserves to be treated with dignity and respect simply because they're a member of the human family and um, they uh, should be afforded that courtesy even when they've done bad things, even when they've stolen, even when they've lied, even when they've sexually harassed, even when they've used racial epithets, even when they have gotten into fights. Um, that doesn't change their humanity and it doesn't change uh, the way that we want to interact with them. The way that we treat people in most cases says more about who we are 
than about who the person is that we are treating. And so if, if you keep the high road, if you keep that level of respect, in most cases, it works out best for everyone. Um, so when you move to the, the termination decision, you want to have a procedure in place um, that requires certain levels of review. Um, in, a, a, in an organization, um, you're, you're going to want to have probably uh, at least the, the, the line supervisor and the manager and HR. That would probably be a pretty minimal level of review. You might not require um, the, the manager if this is, say, a probationary employee. Um, if you're talking about a long service employee, say somebody over five years of, ex of service, you might want to have the unit manager or perhaps someone from the legal department to, to review to see if there's any issues that have escaped the notice at this point. So those are some things to keep in mind in terms of that process that you want to have. And you want that to be explicit. You want people to know what their level of authority is so that somebody doesn't suddenly decide they can fire people. Um, maybe that wasn't part of their responsibilities. Um, when the, it is time to meet with a person to communicate that decision, you're going to want to have a document. Uh, the name of the document is going to vary depending upon the particular employee, employment uh, culture that you have. Um, where I worked, it was called a reason for dismissal, uh, but that name, there's nothing magical about that. It's usually going to be a short document, two or three sentences, maybe just one sentence sometimes, that summarizes why this employment decision is being made. And then there's the opportunity for uh, the employee to sign. The signature doesn't mean the employee agrees. Very likely the employee doesn't agree. Instead, what the signature means is that he has been, this document has been shared with him or her, that he or she has had a chance to see it. Um, and usually there's a place in the form so that the employee can write a rebuttal uh, to say what facts he thinks were untrue or what conclusion he feels was unjustified. Um, the employee kind of has a choice about whether to complete that or not, but whether or not he completes it or rebuts it, he still doesn't mean that he necessarily agrees with the statement. When the termination happens, it ought to include the employee, um, most likely his manager or the manager's manager, and someone from HR, somebody within that line of supervision and then somebody from HR. Um, the reason that you want to have two people from the company's management present is twofold. First of all, each one is going to do a different part of the termination. The manager is the one who's going to present the reason for the termination. After all, the manager is in the position to know whether Bob was doing this or not doing this or whatever. The HR a professional is there to communicate HR information, things like eligibility for COBRA, things like getting back various and sundry doc documents, or not so much documents, but maybe badges or um, company credit cards or things along those lines. Um, getting keys back to the, the locker, um, explaining how you certain items will be um, you know, sent to them or, or, or what information that this employee ought to expect to receive when the employee will get his final paycheck, those types of administrative matters. So one of the reasons you have both folks present is because each person has his or her own area of expertise. The second reason though is that it's good to have two ears because um, it's an emotional experience. Um, it's obviously most difficult on the employee, but it's not at all easy for either the manager or the HR professional. And when emotions are running high, when there's a lot of tension, sometimes fear can be a, a, a part of that. It can become confusing who said what. And so having another set of ears uh, to be present, to hear what's happening can be a, a way of kind of documenting the occurrences more clearly. It's a good idea, especially if something surprising happened during the meeting, to have both participants to prepare some kind of statement about what was said or what was done or something along those lines. Um, 
there ought to be a clear process. Uh, many times the HR person will uh, kind of coach the manager about how to proceed. And there may even be kind of a dry rehearsal done. Okay, you'll say this part, I'll say this part, then you'll do this part, then I'll do this part. Um, and so everyone kind of knows what their assigned role is. And having that kind of structure helps the meeting proceed reasonably quickly. And yet it also ensures that everything is covered. And as I said before, this is at the end of the day designed hopefully to make the process as um, palatable as possible to that employee. The employee doesn't want to spend any more time in that meeting than is absolutely necessary and yet he or she does need to get some information and he or she should be given the opportunity to ask questions and and get some closure in those areas if that's possible. So you, you want to structure it in a way that's going to be very respectful and mindful of that employee. Um, the meeting itself should be private. The door should be closed. Um, the uh, meeting should be in a place that is um, uh, apart from the work area so that no one's going to be coming into the work area uh, to inter interfere or to, um, you know, inadvertently interrupt the meeting. Um, there ought to be provisions made for the employee who might become emotional, tearful, angry, um, uh, having tissues available, uh, allowing the, the, the employee have some time to collect himself. It's a good practice to allow the employee to uh, collect his own things. In most cases, assuming there isn't a concern about safety, that can be a courtesy. But oftentimes the employee won't want to do it in front of his or her workers. Uh, that's embarrassing. And so what you may do is you might schedule the meeting for the end of the day. And so after the workers have cleared out, then you uh, and the employee go back to the work area and pack up the things. Now, there are times because of security issues or concerns about safety that you may not want the employee to return to the work area. In those cases, then of course you would very likely have packed up things for the employee and give it to the employee at that time. Um, many times, especially when the employee knows that this is likely to happen, the employee will have already brought home most of his or her personal effects. And so there may be relatively little that you have to do to uh, uh, get the employee's um, issues squared away. Um, changing passwords is an important thing. Uh, turning off access to various things, credit cards, uh, computers, buildings, things like that can be an important concern. Um, there can be hacking and sabotage of things and so it's important to think through those issues. The employee has a company issued laptop or cell phone or some other device that the employee may have. It's important to have researched those beforehand so that you can say, listen, we understand that you've got this device, do you have it with you? How can we make arrangements to get that? Again, having a checklist where you have all of those action items established and you can go through it methodically and with relatively little emotion um, is, is an appropriate way of handling this. After the employee leaves, it's very likely that there will be questions. Where's Bob? I see Bob's office is empty. What happened? Um, the best way to handle it is just to say, um, I can't go into specifics. Bob doesn't work here anymore and leave it at that. Um, Bob may well say all kinds of things. Um, as I, I gave you the example a few minutes ago of, of the man who told his wife he was laid off when uh, that wasn't at all the reason for his end of employment. So Bob may tell a story that is completely not true. He may tell a story that's a little bit true and a little bit not true, or he may tell the completely accurate story. Um, the employees may believe Bob, or they may not believe Bob. Um, but the best course of action for the employer is just to say, I'm sorry, I just, just can't com comment upon that and not to say anything negative about Bob, and not to talk about it in a way that suggests, oh yeah, if you knew the true story, boy, you'd think something different's going on here. And it ought to be kept very neutral and um, not focus upon that issue at all. 
Sometimes employers um, are tempted to make an example of a particular employee. Oh, well, Bob was caught stealing. Well, we think other people might be involved. So if everybody knows why Bob was, was, was fired, maybe that will make people be more reluctant to go ahead and steal. Um, that uh, sometimes uh, uh, is a temptation to, to do that type of thing, but it is almost always a bad idea to do that because you get into defamation situations. Um, even if it's 100% true and you know it's true, um, you are still getting in a position uh, that you don't look very magnanimous. Bob's lost his job and now you're destroying his reputation on top of that. That's not going to sit right with a lot of people, even if everything that you said is 100% true. And the reality is um, it's difficult to know exactly what happened. Um, and so once you start telling the story, you're connecting the facts in a particular way that may not be exactly the way someone else sees those same facts. Certainly would not necessarily be the way that Bob sees those facts. And so as you grapple with these issues, uh, you're kind of walking into a line, landmine where you might stumble onto something, make an inadvertent error in how you describe how something happened, and now there's a defamation claim. So it's best to just keep it with, Bob no longer works here. Um, I, I'm, I'm, that, that's all I can share. Let's get back to work and uh, treat the situation as a matter of confidentiality. Um, the, Texas does have a final wage law. Um, when the employee is dismissed from employment, in other words, involuntarily separated, then the employee is entitled to get his pay within six calendar days of the dismissal. If the employee voluntarily quits, his next paycheck should be at the same time that he otherwise would have been paid for that time. Um, employees are almost always eligible for COBRA. Um, remember, COBRA is the ability to continue the insurance at um, non-active rates. It's really 102% of the full cost of the insurance policy. Uh, so since the employer really isn't out any money by granting the COBRA benefits, the idea is that um, there really shouldn't be a reason that the employer doesn't grant a COBRA under the vast majority of situations. Um, that's somewhat not true, especially when the employer is self-insured, uh, because employees who continue COBRA are oftentimes um, deciding to continue because they happen to have a genuine health crisis uh, going on. And so therefore, they are more likely to be heavy users of the health insurance under those circumstances. Um, so that, that assumption that I just made is not always correct, but they, the employee is still entitled to use COBRA. There is an exception that does allow employers when there is gross misconduct to exclude employees from the COBRA benefit. Um, I worked for an organization that had 150,000 employees and I'm not aware of a single time where the, where the employer um, used that gross misconduct out. Uh, you know, I can imagine that there could be times where you might, but it would be very, very rare. Certainly not for um, your standard reasons that you might fire somebody. You want to make sure that you communicate all that COBRA information. In many cases, that's going to be sent electronically through or, or through snail mail too, uh, from some um, uh, service that uh, some uh, service that you use to to generate those types of notices. But in some cases, the HR uh, professional might actually give that information to the employee at the time of the dismissal. Um, how to handle the, the situation where the employer thinks that there may be some liability risks associated with the dismissal. In a perfect world, um, you would never encounter the situation. You would always make the best employment decisions and those decisions would always be completely defendable and you'd never have to worry about paying any type of settlement. Um, that's not the world that I live in. Um, there are times where you absolutely think we have to end this employment relationship, but you also know that there is a, a measurable risk, anywhere from significant to maybe very significant. And under those circumstances, sometimes the best way to resolve it is to um, 
provide some type of settlement agreement. You might call it severance. You might call it something else um, so that the employee can leave with some financial support and yet the employee can't then turn around and sue the employer. So it's a way of settling any claims that might exist. Um, most employers don't routinely do this in situations where you are dismissing someone because of some kind of misconduct, but choose when the facts are supportive that that may be a way to save the employer some money. If the employee is over the age of 40, you always have to consider the Older Workers Benefit Protection Act provisions. I'm just put this here. Older Workers Benefit Protection Act. This is an amendment to the ADEA. And it requires certain things and releases that have to be present in order to successfully release a claim of age discrimination. We don't have these same types of protections available for sex discrimination or national origin discrimination or race discrimination or disability discrimination. These protections extend only to age discrimination. But um, if you're going to use the, 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 the forms in the age discrimination case, you'd want to use it in all cases, right? So, I mean, there, there's really no reason not to follow the Older Workers Benefit Protection Act elements, even if there isn't an age claim. Um, and we've talked about these before, so I'm not going to go into detail, but it has to do with how many days um, the employee gets to consider the, the offer, uh, what the revocation process is, if he changes his mind after he signs it, what particular language has to be in the, uh, the waiver. Lots of very technical, somewhat nitpicky things. Definitely things that you'd want somebody in your legal department to be involved in before you actually uh, share that type of release with the employee. Well, at this time we're done. We've covered um, the issue of constructive discharge. We talked about employment at will. We discussed, or very briefly discussed, the various bases that you can have for a dismissal. We talked about the situation where you are in a unionized workforce or you work for the government uh, and what the due process or a just cause standards might be. And we've discussed how we approach terminations. Um, here's a few final thoughts that I'd like to share with you. At will employment is likely to be the standard that you're going to be working with in your employment situation, but just keep in mind that it is not a blank check, that a smart employer assumes that good cause is necessary. Uh, assumes it because the jury that's probably going to hear the case will, will expect to see that good cause was present. Before an employer decides to dismiss someone, the employer should look very carefully at the facts, give the employee an opportunity to share his or her um, thoughts and experiences about the situation, and the employer ought to think about what the legal risks are. Uh, sometimes that is something that can be handled solely by the uh, HR department. Sometimes it's a very good idea to get someone from the legal department involved as well. Through the dismissal process, the employer ought to be focusing on making that process as uh, uh, comfortable and as uh, 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 less unpleasant as possible for that discharged employee, treating him or her with dignity, professionalism, and confidentiality. And in the right case, a waiver can be an effective way of addressing the employee's needs and the employer's needs, getting resolution about the employment relationship. Well, I thank you for your attention. It's been a pleasure making this presentation today. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. My email is cgroover at colin.edu. cgroover at colin.edu. I look forward to hearing from you. Or, even better, please feel free to stop by and we can talk at great detail on these topics. I thank you for your attention, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care.